Hello, welcome to the BBC News Facebook page for this Facebook Live, and I'm delighted to be joined by someone who is the editor of a very famous magazine. It's probably one of the most famous magazines in the world. It was founded in 1888. Susan Goldberg, editor of National Geographic magazine. Thank you so much for having me. Very warm welcome to you. Now, the idea is that obviously you send us your messages, which I can put to Susan. A lot of things to talk about, the kind of survival of a, a magazine in a digital age. What does National Geographic actually stand for? What does it do? Why do people buy it? How does it adapt to a, a, a kind of a digital world in which we live in? So please send us your messages and I can put them to Susan. While we wait for those messages to come in, Susan, I wanted to first ask you, what is the kind of the remit of National Geographic magazine? These days, I think the remit is to tell some of the most important, urgent stories that are going on around the world to really lean into factual, authentic journalism, but through National Geographic's lens, which is a beautiful visual lens, scientific, history, people and cultures. Those are the ways that we always tell stories, whether they're about the environment or gender or climate change, anything that we do, we want to do it through those kinds of lenses. And it was founded in 1888, wasn't it? You're only the 10th editor, which is, which is incredible. You're only the first woman to edit the magazine am, as well. So when it first started out, what was it trying to do then and how has that kind of evolved over the years? So National Geographic started with the remit of diffusing geographic knowledge. That is actually what it said. And it, it was founded in Washington, D.C. by the this group of scientists and explorers who really thought that the world needed to know more, or that Americans needed to know more about the rest of the world. Now, I'm looking down at my phone, nothing personal. No. Obviously, we're getting messages in already, oh, which I, and I'll put, look down and, and, and pass them on to you. A message from Greg, who actually owns National Geographic now? So, uh, in November of 2014, we expanded a partnership that we had had for 20 years with 21st Century Fox, and we had had a partnership with them with our television channel and 21st Century Fox. That was expanded then to include all of our media, so National Geographic magazine, Traveler magazine, uh, all of our all of our um, newsstand magazines, the book division. It includes. Um, uh, all of our digital and social media. It includes our trips business, our catalog business. Mm -hmm. So 21st Century Fox owns that. That's called National Geographic yeah. Partners. But we're still in partnership with the nonprofit National Geographic Society. When I've, I think of National Geographic magazine, I think of photography, of pictures. Yes. Those are the things which have really, over the years, have stood out, haven't they? So how have you kept that relevant in a, in a world where everyone's got a, a phone in their camera. How do you break through? So I think it's really more relevant than ever because everybody has a phone in their hand. We are the largest media brand on Instagram. We have about 90 million followers mm. to our Instagram accounts. Uh, and I, Let's have a look at some of these images here we're oh seeing because yeah. these are some so, just a selection of stunning images. Right. Tell, tell us about these. So things. this is a, an, an image actually taken by one of our readers on our Your Shot platform and I like this image because it shows how people are accessing our photography now. This is the platform on which people are going to view our professional journalism. Sure. So it's not just about the the highly trained professional photographers, but it is, you obviously want those as well. Let's have a look at some of these other images sure. as well. Now, and, these I mean, are, this that's, is... That's a natural <laughs> kind of shot, isn't it? Yes, this is an epic picture taken by Charlie Hamilton James, who is one of our National Geographic photographers. And he took this, uh, he's outside, those are the Grand Teton Mountains in the background, and we had an entire issue devoted to Yellowstone. And that was one of, I think, the very best pictures in the in the entire issue. Sure, a message from Reyes. Um, Susan, how do, important is it to engage our youth with nature and the visual allure of National Geographic. And I guess images like that well, help do that, don't Yes, they? I think this is such a great question and I feel like we're so lucky at National Geographic because the things that we've been covering for 130 years are things that millennials care about. They care about the environment and climate change and species preservation and scientific innovation and they also want to do good and we give back 27 percent of our profits to our nonprofit National Geographic Society so the society can keep doing education exploration and research. Well that ties into a question from AJ who asked what are you doing for endangered species I guess it's all very well showing images of well, them but what can you actually, actually do? If you can and, see and, and places where in the world where you know, there are people are threatened or communities are under threat. 
Well, the picture on the screen right now, that is taken in Manu National Forest in Peru. It was also taken by Charlie Hamilton James. And not only is that one of the most biodiverse areas in the world, but it's also one of the areas that has the largest number of uncontacted and little contacted tribes. And you can see the shock on these women's faces when they, when they encountered our photographer. But Manu is a place that's threatened by logging and development around the edges of the park. So what we're doing is bringing those issues to Light. Sure. Um, the um, I guess one of the issues is at the moment. It's about. I look at that picture there. That's amazing. Oh, can I tell you about this one? Yeah, go for All it. All right. We'll come back so this is stuff. taken by our photographer Brian Scary, who uh, he's one of our underwater photographers. Our photographers often specialize. So Brian is an underwater photographer. This is taken about a hundred miles off the coast of San Diego in the United States, and uh, that is a a juvenile, I think, harp seal playing in the kelp. And what's interesting is this is one of the areas that um, a lot of people really wanted President Obama to preserve as a, as a marine preserve before he left office. And we'll see what happens now. Sure. And a, a reminder, isn't it? Because everyone, as I say, can take a photograph now, but not many people can get a photograph quite like that. There's a real art to photography still. Well, I think now that everybody has a camera in their hands 24-7, they realize how incredible the art is of a profession, our professional photographers. So moving away from photography for a second, what's the kind of... Do, do, are you on a mission as National Geographic to sort of help the, the environment? Is that Are you an environmental sort of campaign magazine in some ways, or are you... What do you kind of, how objective can you be about various issues? Oh, I'm, I'm really glad you asked. So we are very proudly nonpartisan, but we stand for three things. We are on the side of facts, we are on the side of science, and we're on the side of the planet. And I think you can be on the side of the planet without it becoming a political issue. Because that ties us into a very, you know, timely issue, that of fake news and various agendas being put forward and the controversy surrounding that. So you see yourself, do you, as a kind of a standard bearer with a lot of history behind you. I don't just see ourselves that way. We are that way. And, um, you know, this, I, I agree that there's been a lot of fake news put out there. But what our space is, is, you know, we are going to tell stories that are factual, that are correct, that are balanced, that are fair. And we're, we're not going to pick a political side, but that's our, our place in this debate. Sure. Let's have a quick look at some of these other images here, because, I mean, it's just capturing a moment, isn't it? And a moment and an image can speak a thousand words. What's this one? Here? So this is a very important story that we did about a year ago about blindness and about how so much blindness these days can be prevented or cured, either through really simple means like cataract surgeries or through really high-tech medicine like nuclear medicine and genetic medicine. This picture, picture was taken in... Um, in India where so many people unnecessarily go blind just because they don't have access to the simplest kinds of surgeries. How important do you think your images have been over the years? What difference have they actually made? Oh, well, as you say, a picture speaks a thousand words. I, I think you can look at our images as opening the door to the world for so many people who otherwise would never really get to understand everything that was out there. And many people probably w wouldn't have seen a, a photographer before, I guess. I don't know where, where these images were here. But well, I mean... this is a really interesting story. So we've done a series of stories about parks, and that last image was taken in Virunga National Park in the Congo. It is the most dangerous place in the world to be a park ranger. 140 park rangers have been killed in Virunga in the last 10 years. They've been killed by poachers and various militias. And, you know, these folks are trying to protect, you know, the elephants from the ivy, ivory poachers. Sure, and I guess as you, as, as the years go by and your, um, I guess, the, the, does the surprise and the shock element ever reduce? Because we get more used to seeing terrible things, don't we? Well, you get used to seeing terrible things and good things and beautiful things, but I don't think you ever get used to seeing a picture that moves you. And there isn't a single issue of National Geographic, either in print or in its, in its digital editions, that you can't look at and not be moved. Sure. I mean, you've got many, many followers, haven't you, on, on Snapchat, on, on oh, Instagram as well? Yes. I mean, that's been one of the most interesting things. So we have about 13 million young people who come to us each month just on Snapchat. But on Facebook, for example, we have more than 150 million friends. So Facebook has become a really important publishing platform as well. Sure. And I guess the... Um 
as you say, it's moving with the times, isn't it? And an image like this. Well, so this is Instagram. And, you know, one of the things that I love looking at is what are our, some of our most liked pictures on Instagram? So this is a picture uh, taken by Brian Scarry, our under, underwater photographer. And it's a, it's a baby harp seal. So it's a really cute picture of a baby animal. But Brian, in his caption there, is really telling why this is important. He says, thinning ice due to climate change over the last decade has caused problems for this species. So we can suck people into these, um, into, in with our beautiful photography, but then really tell them an important story. Sure. What's your... Um Oh, look at okay, that. Well, wow. yeah, okay. Okay, you go for the R factor, don't you? Oh, I mean, you've got to have the R factor. Way. Now, this is a picture taken by our photographer, Amy Vitale, who did a story for us uh, in our issue last June about a program to rewild pandas in China. So they're breeding these pandas, and then they're setting this endangered species back out into the wild. And she has more adorable baby panda pictures. <laughs> Interesting question from Vanessa. What is your position regarding publishing photography coming just from anyone across the world? Do you have a sort of a, a quality? threshold or do you just accept well, photographs from everyone? No, we don't. Um, so we have a group of photographers that we work with, that we contract with to, to take photographs for us, but we do have platforms that the public can engage with. Uh, we have something called Your Shot. So if you looked at YourShot.com, the public can sign up to take pictures. We send the public on assignments mm. and then National Geographic photo editors actually will look at those pictures. I guess because there was a, a time when I was a kid, but you, the only access to wildlife was like watching a David Attenborough documentary. Sure. There is still that. There but is this still. is a new way of doing it, isn't it? And I guess it's this is. more effective in some ways. And we really like the pictures taken by our Your Shot community. I mean, we get a, a range of very, very talented folks taking pictures on, on those platforms. Sure. What's the future then? I mean, every media organization is grappling, isn't it, aren't they, with this kind of the digital world. It's about engaging young people. What, what do you, what's going to happen next, do you think? Where is this going to go? Well, I think we've got a tremendous future because we appeal so much to this next generation of readers and users. But we need to make sure that we're giving them the news and information they want on the platforms that they want to receive it. What we work, you know, what we and everybody else are working on is what is the business model that supports that. Yeah, it's like a couple of images I think I, I just heard in my ear there. This is, oh, what a beautiful oh, shot of the line, all right. So this is from a wonderful project called Photo Arc by Joel Sartori, and um, Joel has made it a it's a 25-year project to take pictures of the 12,000 species of captive, um, of captive animals in captivity. And the reason he's doing that is because if we stay on the road we are on, half of those species are going to be gone by 2100. So he takes pictures of these heroic animals, these lions, tigers... I think the next one might be a bear. There oh, we go. But he it. also takes pictures of the not heroic animals. If you go to the next one, like this rat or <laughs> this <softer>. snail <laughs> or those, or keep going. Or the frogs. And Joel's message is every animal is important. And his motto is, if I can get somebody to care, if I can get them to fall in love, then I can get them to take action. And that is a pretty good 15-word mission statement for everything we'd it like to do. Absolutely is. And it's interesting, the aesthetics of animals always fascinates me because there are animals which we think, oh, don't they look lovely? There are animals which don't look lovely, and yet they are as important. It's like the role of insects is, oh. is underplayed by many people, isn't it? it? And they are... Without insects, life would not exist. Absolutely. And actually, in Joel, in his photo arc project, and you can see it at photoarc.com and also on nationalgeographic.com, he has every kind of animal and many insects, birds, fish, you know, sort of the, some of the smaller animals that you know, aren't the ones that are as charismatic. Yeah, not box office. Not but, box but office. Yet vital. But, but super important. Yeah. And actually, these pictures that you can see behind us, we like Joel's project so much that we turned some of those pictures into the cover of the April issue of National Geographic magazine. And we put out 10 different pictures on the April cover, and mostly because we couldn't decide which one we liked the best. Okay, there you go. Oh, and wow. here are some of his pictures that he's taken. Yeah, They're beautiful, just they? beautiful. And with content like this, we use it across platforms. So we have a photo arc book, we use it in the magazine, we use it at nationalgeographic.com, we share it across all of our digital platforms. Message, message from Eleanor, beautiful. Oh, there you go. beautiful. Well, there you go, absolutely, I, I agree with Eleanor. Thank you so much, Susan, it's been a real oh, pleasure to meet you. And I remember you. reading National Geographic when I was a kid, and in doctor's waiting rooms amongst other places and it's so interesting to see the the magazine evolve over the years, it's distinctive kind of yellow borders are still there, aren't they? And yet 
the digital world providing opportunities as well. Oh, Very the, interesting. Our, our border now is not just in print, yeah. it's a digital yellow border. Yeah. We're really proud of that. Susan Goldberg, editor of National Geographic, thanks very much indeed. And thank you too for watching this BBC News Facebook Live. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.